Well, coming up in our next two segments, we're headed to the Black Hills, where two biologists are working to educate people on some of the hills' lesser known and maybe a little misunderstood creatures. First off, when many of us think of West River wildlife, we usually think of buffalo, antelope, and maybe a prairie dog. But do you ever think about Black Hills reptiles or amphibians? We're going to meet a crew from Black Hills State University that's focused in on some of these often overlooked animals. This is this is what we do. I mean, we we got you can't you can't understand anything about your study animal. I think in many cases, without being in the field, looking at them, knowing where they hang out, knowing what they do. Really, you know, keeping your eyes on the ground, keeping your eyes open is one of the best ways to learn about your study animal. For Dr. Brian Smith, an associate professor at Black Hill State University, and his team of field students, those study animals consist of the various reptiles and amphibians found in the Black Hills. The Plains area, in general, has been overlooked in... um, studies of reptiles and amphibians and we don't really have much uh, much data from out here. Um, what we're trying to do is um, is look at you know the the broad picture across the hills. We're not looking at abundance or anything like that. What we're trying to do is fill in the overall distribution of reptiles and amphibians across the Black Hills. Dr. Smith's study is funded by the State Game Fish and Parks, and it takes him and his team all across the area, from high altitudes up in the hills down to lower wetlands. Now, Dr. Smith, I've heard that you can judge the health of an ecosystem by the health of its amphibians. Is there some truth to that? Yeah, um, amphibians in general will pass water through their skin um, relatively, relatively rapidly. It's as if a frog is sort of made of water if you want to think of it that way because it evaporates off their skin they pull it up from the pond as it evaporates away that means the water is constantly going through the body of that frog so if there's toxins in that water they're constantly being moved through the frog and frogs don't survive in that kind of uh, in that kind of situation for very long so if you find a healthy frog population you can kind of assume from that that there's not a whole lot of toxins in that water. On today's outing, Dr. Smith's crew is comprised of Ben Blake, who was introduced to herpetology in 2002, Jody Massey, a biology major working towards her PhD, and Laura Lynn Cottingham, a biochem double major. It's fun and it's just, it's nice to be outside and not cooped up in a lab all day. Once Laurelyn and the other students find an animal, they try to gather all the information they can to better understand its habits. We're looking for a specific location, what kind of what the temperature is, because when you you take data, then you learn what kind of things you, to look for in the future. You know, like um, if it's a certain temperature when you found it that day, then maybe it's more likely that you're going to find it in a certain temperature or a certain location the next day. And such is the information the crew will take down about its latest find, one of the most common reptiles in the Black Hills. It's a red-sided garter snake. You find them a lot of places. Um, Plains garter snakes more down on the plains. Red-sided's more up in the hills, but you can find them in, you can find these on the plains and you can find the plains up into the hills, at least to here, because I know these guys have found them here. So far, the team has had great success at the pond, They've collected data for a leopard frog, a turtle, and now a red-sided garter snake. But Dr. Smith and his crew don't spend all their time searching wetlands. They also head high into the hills looking for another reptilian resident. If people were to associate a reptile with the Black Hills, it would probably be the rattlesnake. Dr. Smith and his crew study these as well, but they use a little more caution than they do with the leopard frog. What we're doing when we're up on those hillsides is we are deliberately looking for snakes. We're poking under rocks. We're off in heavy brush. Um, You just can't see those snakes in that stuff. And when you're in there, you know that you're walking. For every snake you see, there's probably 10 snakes you don't see. And I think, in general, it's it's fairly dangerous. I think even even what we're doing is um, somewhat dangerous. Watch yourself. Okay. You have to know the habitat. You have to know where they're, 
or they're going to be and that's one thing that you learn just from experience after going out and survey after survey you get to really know just right where the, where the right place is where they're going to be and so what you need to do is you have to always just keep looking down I mean, for rattlesnakes and, and you just have to be careful because they don't always rattle. You know in any area you want to watch where you put your feet but here especially you know you never want to put your feet anywhere where you can't see you never want to put your hand anywhere somewhere where you can't see that's why I always use these sticks for turning over boulders for looking under logs you never want to put your hand down there you know and it's funny the longer that you work on something like this the more alert you are you'll see something move out of the corner of your eye and it might be a mammal it might be a stick but you'll freeze and you'll look and that's you know you're thinking about what, what am I seeing you know is there anything moving in the grass where am I putting my feet Am I putting myself in danger? Am I going to roll down the hill? It's the combined experience of both professor and students that make the following encounter a safe and beneficial one. How about this rock here? You just go back under there. All I see is part of his side. Oh, yeah, Jody, I'm going to try it. Oh, there he is. Yep. I see his head. Okay. Am I anywhere there's, close to There's him? no hole at all, so he's just sitting in the corner. Up more over here. This side then. <laughs> what do you mean? She looks. I know. Oh yeah. He's right there. And his head's poking up too. There he is. Okay, we got him. Alright. Now reptiles, you know, I mean people could come up with all kinds of reasons why they're either useful or important. I mean they're a they're a control on on a lot of small rodent populations, if a lot of people um, in South Dakota that have ranches and that have, have uh, farms realize this. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions of basically how rattlesnakes are out to attack you, and if you're in the woods, they sort of come after you, and there really aren't any that many snakes that'll do that, and rattlesnakes definitely won't. And the rattlesnakes will never come after you. Basically, you have to kind of step on them or get up real close to them before they will strike at you. I think the main thing about snakes is that they're misunderstood. I know a lot of people that will go out of their way to squish them on the roads and you know there's a lot of misconceptions that like uh, like Ben was saying earlier that they'll come after you they're trying to attack you like the rattlesnakes here they just want to get away from you you know if you're poking them and you're you know harassing them of course they're going to defend themselves but if you keep your distance they're going to leave you know they're just going to try and get away and you know a lot of other snakes like garter snakes are harmless you know little smooth green snakes I think a lot of people see a snake and assume it's poisonous assume it's going to attack you and bite you and that's just not true with all snakes 